Welcome to the Renaissance Church Podcast. Our mission is to glorify God and to make disciples by bringing the gospel into all of life in all the earth. This is Chris Kipp, lead pastor of Renaissance Church here in Richmond, Texas. And if you've not joined us in a worship gathering or at a house church yet, we would love to have you join us. You can find out more information at rin-church.org. And I pray that you are encouraged and edified by the proclamation of God's word today. We are, as I said, beginning a new series today, and it's called Margin. And we're going to start in Luke chapter 10. And what I want to focus on is making room for what matters most. So Luke chapter 10, if you want to start turning there with me, if you have a copy of scriptures, you can go there. We're going to have it on the screen for you in just a minute. Um, Years ago, I was driving into Houston. I was driving down uh, Highway 69. I was going to a meeting, and we were meeting with uh, a guy who consults churches. So I was a planter. I was in the process of planting and this guy helps church leaders put into words what their, what their vision, their, their mission is. And so I was just kind of puzzling in my mind over like, gosh, what's going to happen in this meeting? And like, what's God putting in my heart as I'm, I'm driving? And on the way, I'm like one of the first people on this massive like six car wreck in the middle of 69 where it's like, I see it and cars start going everywhere. And in the middle... Uh, of this whole, you know, like, you know, six car wreck, there is one car and it looks like smoke's coming off the hood. And I have that, you know, that adrenaline response whenever you're like, you see that and you have to slam on your brakes, right? So I have this like, you know, this thing going on inside of me. And as I'm, as I'm sitting there kind of collecting myself, a man in army fatigues runs past my truck and goes right towards the smoking vehicle. And God bless people like that, right? My first thought was like, everyone stay away from the smoking vehicle, okay? But then I had this other thought, Chris, you're a pastor, you should go help them. And so I get out of my truck and I run towards this car with the smoke coming off the hood. And there's a guy in the car, thankfully it's just steam, we can tell it's not, it's just steam coming off, it's not gonna blow. And there's a guy, and he's so in shock, he's shaking, and he cannot say anything. He can't unlock his phone so that we can call somebody. Like, he is completely incapacitated. There's blood, there's broken glass. And as we kind of assessed the situation and we called 911, I said, I'm a pastor, can we pray for him? And everybody there, was like, yes, please. And so we prayed over this guy and we're praying over it's a beautiful moment. And in the middle of this beautiful moment of strangers praying for this man in the middle of a highway, the people that have now lined up along 69 start to get angry. And I'm, I'm, I'm like in mid prayer and it's like, her, her you know, throwing the bird and everyone's like yelling at each other. And it was just like this crazy mashup of like the most beautiful thing you've ever seen and like the worst thing you've ever seen all within the like a few feet of each other. It was crazy, okay? And as I've reflected on that, I got back in my truck and I started driving and this thought came into my mind that it really felt like it was from the Lord, from the Holy Spirit. And it was this, helping people become people again. Like, if I could say, like, what is the, the desire of Jesus for our church is that he wants to help people become the people that he created them to be. And as I thought more about that event, I've thought, you know, it's so easy to say human beings are so selfish and so sinful, and can you believe those guys did that, right? You know, and it's easy to point the finger at selfishness and sinfulness, but then I started to wonder is what if those are people who are marginless? What I mean is, when you're so wound up on the inside and then one thing happens and it throws off your day, what comes out of us is anger, frustration, flipping the bird off. Hopefully you don't have your Renaissance Church sticker on the back of your car when you do that, right? (laughs) 
Please don't do that. <laughs> what if they were marginless people? Um, how many of you would say that you occasionally or somewhat often feel stressed? Can I just see your hand real quick? Just occasionally or somewhat often feel stressed? Yeah, me too. That's me. Um, if I asked how you're doing, you would probably say busy. How many of you would feel like, yeah, you know, like we're, we're just busy right now? Busy? Yep. Yeah. How many of you would say that finances have felt tight or you felt some financial stress? Yeah? A few of you? Yep. Yeah. Um, how many of you would say that you wish you had more time either for yourself or for the people that you love the most? Yeah, all right? So we're all there. We're, we're all there, hands going up everywhere. And I think there's something in us that's crying out for margin, for space. Um, I, uh, I'll just keep confessing my sins to you to make you feel better about yourselves, okay? Um, so um, there have been times where I have reacted to my children and they needed discipline, okay? They needed to be corrected, but my reaction level had less to do with their need to be corrected and more to do with all the other things that were piling up on the inside of myself. Anyone ever been there before? Just made me feel better about myself. Okay, thank you, thank you. Confession is good for the soul. <laughs> we have this saying, the straw that broke the camel's back, right? You guys know that saying, right? And, and it's this picture of a camel that is so loaded down that just the slightest little thing is added on top and that's the thing that makes it break. And I wonder how many of us would say that we're probably in that camp. It's like there's just so much going on in our lives that just one more thing might be the thing that broke us. I found this quote. It's by Dr. Richard Swenson. He wrote a book about margin. It's called Margin. And here's what he says. The conditions of modern day living devour margin. If you are homeless, we send you to a shelter. If you are penniless, we offer you food stamps. If you are breathless, we connect you to oxygen. But if you are marginless, we give you one more thing to do. <laughs> I found this cartoon that I thought like summed that up perfectly. I don't know if you can show that for us. Yeah. Like the person piled up with stuff around them on their desk and someone pokes their head in and says, you busy? <laughs> yeah. Most of us are feeling that in our lives. Before we dive into Luke 10, I just want to define margin for us. Margin is the amount available beyond what is necessary. It's the amount that is available beyond what is necessary. Or think of it this way, it's the distance between what you need and what you have. Now, I was trying to find an image of a book that had no margins in it. And the funny thing is, there aren't any. Because every publisher knows that you would never print a book that had no margins because it would be so difficult to read and so frustrating that nobody would ever read the book. And it's kind of like our lives. Whenever we are pushed to the limits, when we've gone beyond what we need, right, and we're into the margins of our lives, we start running out of space. And it's when we're in that place, it's just like one more thing might be the thing that sent us spiraling. Dr. Swinson, he defines it this way. Margin is the space between our load and our limits. It's like this. If I had 30 minutes, right, to get somewhere, and it takes 20 minutes to get there, then I have 10 minutes of margin, right? If I left 30 minutes early, it takes 20 minutes, then I have 10 minutes of margin. Now, I typically wait till about, I have 15 minutes to get there, and it takes 20 minutes, and I'm five minutes late, right? And then I get stressed out on the road, and I wonder why. Hmm, that's weird. Or it's like this. If I have $100, right, and I have $80 worth of bills, then I have $20 of margin. But most of us, if we have $100, 
let's spend all $100, right? And then that other thing comes along and you get the stress that hits us. Um, I have a, a printer at home that I print things on, right? And every now and then, if I'm printing like a picture or something, it says document exceeds margins, right? It's, it's a malfunction. And just like a printer, we malfunction when we are pushed too far to the edges of our lives. And today, I want to look at the story, a story I've taught on before. It's of Mary and Martha. Many of you know this story. You know already where I'm going this morning, but I want to look at this together. This is Luke Luke 10, verse 38. Here's what it says. While they were traveling, he entered a village, and a woman named Martha welcomed him into her home. She had a sister named Mary, who also sat at the Lord's feet and was listening to what he said. But Martha was distracted by her many tasks. And she came up and asked, Lord, don't you care that my sister has left me to serve alone? So tell her to give me a hand. I bet Jesus loves that after a long trip. And it's like people are complaining, right? He handles it so well. Verse 41. The Lord answered her, Martha, Martha, you are worried and upset about many things, but one thing is necessary. Mary has made the right choice, and it will not be taken away from her. This is the word of the Lord. So picture that, okay? Jesus comes to town. It's not like our time where people can call you. Like, I don't know if you've, have you ever hosted Thanksgiving? A few of you, yeah, you've hosted Thanksgiving. And you knew, hopefully, months in advance, maybe weeks in advance, that we're going to be doing this. And so you had some planning and some foresight. But these guys, they, there was no like texting or emailing beforehand. It's like Jesus rolls into town, and Martha's like, come on. And then she's looking at all the guys behind him. She's like, ooh. Like, at least 13 people, probably more, are now coming to her house. And she's got to, you know, throw a Thanksgiving dinner like that, right? And Aunt Betty's not coming with the dressing. Like, she's going to have to do it all herself. And it says that she welcomes them. She's happy about this, but she's probably feeling a little bit overwhelmed. And it's the unexpected things that always reveal our lack of margin, the, the Greek uh, word for distracted, it means to draw away, to be driven about mentally, to be overoccupied, too busy about a thing. That's, that's what it means. She is overoccupied. She is too busy. She's driven about mentally. She's distracted by her many tasks. And the first thing I want us to see this morning is that when margin decreases, your stress increases. Everyone say, duh. (laughs) Right? When margin decreases, your stress increases. And Martha's feeling the stress. Uh, Dr. Hans Selye, he's the late Canadian endocrinologist and the father of stress research, he defines stress as the nonspecific response of the body to any demand made upon it. The nonspecific response of the body, meaning it's like it could show up in lots and lots of different ways. It could show its ugly head in many different ways. It's a nonspecific response to any demand that is made upon it. And it's not the circumstance, it's the response to the circumstance. Um, There's three types of stress that uh, researchers talk about. The first one is called eustress. It's E-U stress, eustress. And it's the good kind. It's like if you've ever played a, a football game, guys, and you were psyching yourself up beforehand right? You had your song that you put on, and you're like, come on, let's go. Or like uh, soccer dads, and you, you, you drive your kid out to the soccer field, and you have Eye of the Tiger, because you're like, come on, son, 
Let's get the eye of the tiger, right? Like, let's, let's, get, let's get pumped up today, right? That's, that's, that's a good, that's kind of a, a positive stress. And it's, it's a challenge that causes us to be open and resourceful and creative. It's like the deadline at work that's, it's reasonable and it's pushing you and it's good. It's like, this is a good push, Moms, it's that, that, that thing in you that hears the cry in the night and jumps up and is like, I'm there. That there's something in you. It's like it rises to the challenge of the moment. It's, it's a good stress. But the second kind is called distress. And it is what you think it is. It's, it's what we mean when we talk about the word stress. It's when the stress volume becomes negative or destructive. It's when we start pushing outside the margins of our life. This requires management. It's where we recognize it and we sort of try to go positive with it, okay? But then there's a third kind, and maybe you've felt this before, it's called a hyper stress. Anyone ever felt some hyper stress? You've ever been through like a crazy difficult season of your life, right? I have. It's an excessive volume of stress. It's, it's prolonged distress. It's way outside the margins. Like if you were writing it on paper, it's like filling up every part of the margin of your life. And this is not, uh, this is uh, beyond management. This means we have to reduce stress in our lives. The American Psychological Association in a 2022 study said that 76% of adults said that they have experienced health impacts due to stress in the prior month, like the month before the study. It included headache, fatigue, feeling nervous or anxious, and or feeling depressed or sad. They found that seven in 10 adults have experienced additional health impacts due to stress, including feeling overwhelmed, experiencing changes in sleeping habits, and or worrying constantly. So if you felt stress, you're not alone. Like statistically, 75% of us in this room are probably dealing with stress on some level. In Martha, she's feeling it. She's getting worked up as she sees this crowd coming to her house. And if you've ever been stressed out, you know, husbands and wives, and your spouse is sitting on the couch in the most peaceful state, maybe they're just browsing the iPad or catching up on a show. Maybe they have their Bible open. And inside, you're angry, right? you get kind of mad because you're like, how could you be so calm? Don't you know the world is falling down right now? And that's what Martha's feeling in the moment. And the biblical truth that is on display is this. You and I are limited creatures. We serve a limitless God, but we are limited creatures. Don't get me wrong. You're very capable. I know right? There, there is a space on the paper that inside the margins, like that's you. You are all over that. You are capable of that, right? But you are, um, not li- you are not unlimited in your capabilities. You're not unlimited in your capacities. Genesis 1 and 2, if you follow the story of creation, you see that God creates day and he creates night. And night is when we're supposed to be resting. He makes Adam to work in the garden, right? He, he makes Eve to help. They're working together. They're doing stuff. But then there's a point in the day called the cool of the day where God comes and he walks with them. And it's a picture of relationship and time and pleasure and play. Later on, God would institute this thing called a Sabbath day. I was at uh, our local coffee shop the other day, and one of the young workers in his 20s, he comes out of the kitchen, and he gives me my food, and I say hi to him. I said, how are you doing? He goes, I'm just so tired. It's like, it's like I just need a day to not do anything. 
He doesn't come from a Christian background. I was like, have you ever heard of a Sabbath day before? He's like, no, that sounds, that sounds familiar. Like maybe Black Sabbath, like the band, right? Or something. I don't know what he's thinking. <laughs> And I'm like, yeah, it comes from like Jewish law, like God creates the, the world in six days and on the seventh day, he rests. Not because he's tired, but because he's showing people how to live, that they need rest. He's like, oh. And I think he was looking at me like, are you converting me right now, right? I didn't go all in on Jesus at the moment. We're finite, limited creatures, Psalm 103, verse 14, it says, for he, talking about God, knows what we are made of, remembering that we are dust. Did you know that God doesn't expect you to do everything and be everywhere and say yes to everything? He does not expect that from you. But the thing is, we live in a world of progress, 200, 300 years ago, at nighttime, you, you had to go to sleep because guess what? There were no light bulbs in your house. There was no Netflix to watch. There was no glowing screen in your hand. It's like, well, I don't want to burn up the candle, so I guess we'll just go to bed right now, and then we'll get up in 12 hours, and we'll start working. They used to have this thing called a... It was like a, a midnight, like they would wake up after like a good six hours and they would hang out and talk and then they'd go back to bed for their second sleep. If you read documents from that time period, they talk about their second sleep and then they would get up with the sun and start working. Does anybody else want a second sleep? Amen, right? That sounds fantastic. I, I, I think I was born in the wrong time period. But now we have progress and the, the push of progress is more and it's better and it's faster. And the books and the self-help stuff is all about hacking your life just to get a little bit more out of it. And let me tell you, if we live that way, we're going to burn ourselves out. And it's actually not what God wants from you. In verse 40, Martha asked this question, and, and it's a revealing question, right? She says, Lord, don't you care that my sister has left me to serve alone? So tell her to give me a hand. And this is interesting because whenever we get pushed beyond our limit, what happens is things start to go haywire. And one of the things, one of the first things to go haywire, it's, it's this, and it's my second point. When margin decreases, relationships suffer. Anyone else found that out before? When margin decreases, relationships suffer. And all of a sudden, it's not peaceful in the house anymore because Mary is having the best time sitting at the feet of Jesus and Martha is like feeling all the strain in the kitchen and she's looking at her and her eyes are burning through her back. And she's like, Jesus, don't you see how awesome I am and how hard I'm working to make sure that you guys eat? Would you please tell her to join me in the kitchen? Relationships begin to suffer. There's three spheres of relationships. Relationship with God, relationship with self, and relationship with others. You were made for all three of these things, okay? And I would make an argument that if one of these is missing, the others are going to suffer, so this relationship with self, Martha is distracted on the inside. She's feeling all the pressure. She's got all the stuff building up inside of her. It says that she was worried and she is upset. And Martha is maybe feeling all the expectations. Maybe she's the one kind of like me that's kind of a little bit OCD about her kitchen or her house. And she's, you know, she's, she's trying to make sure that the, the toilet paper matches the curtain, the shower curtain, the bathroom, right? She's, she sees a spot on the trim of the door and she's like, oh my gosh, there's there's a black spot on the trim and people are coming, right? You know, she's, maybe she's feeling that way. I don't know, but she's feeling all this pressure on the inside. And so internally, she's a mess. Then relationship with others, she's 
angry with Mary. She's frustrated because Mary is just chilling at the feet of Jesus. And then relationship with God. She's missing out on time with Jesus in her living room. Every sphere suffers. The thing is, misery loves company, doesn't it? And when we're miserable, we just want to spread that around. Let's get everybody stressed out. Come on. Right? And the biblical truth that's on display is that our relationships are the only things that we'll carry with us into eternity. Can I say that again? Our relationships are the only things that we'll carry into eternity. 1 Corinthians 13, 13. Now these three remain. You probably have this bumper sticker. You have it stitched on a little thing in your, on your, in your house, right? These three remain. Faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is... Love. Why? Because when you're in eternity, you're not going to need faith anymore. You will see him face to face. You don't need hope anymore because all your hopes have come true. You are with the Lord. The only thing remaining, the only thing that you will carry with you from this life, it's not your faith, it's not your hope, it's your love. There's this interesting passage, Luke 16, verse 9. And here's what Jesus is talking about, uh, worldly wealth. And he says, I tell you, make friends for yourselves by means of worldly wealth so that when it fails. Now, he said, when it fails, they may welcome you into eternal dwellings. What? So when I see you in eternity, the things that we did here is going, I'm going to remember those things and it's going to matter to me. And I'm going to say, come on over, bro. Hey, thanks for that 20 you spotted me that one day. That was so awesome. Right? Thanks for letting me borrow your lawnmower. I should have brought that back to you. I'm really sorry. (laughs) You know? It's so interesting that it's the relationship that we carry with us into eternity. And here's what Jesus, I think, is trying to get her to understand and getting us to understand is that we can sacrifice ourselves on the altar of the urgent and miss what is actually significant. It's your relationships. And Jesus, his response is so kind and it's so gentle. And here's what he says to her. He says, Martha, Martha, repent, woman, you are in sin. No, he doesn't say that. He says, you are worried and upset about many things, but one thing is necessary. Mary has made, get this, the right choice. You're working so hard for me in the kitchen. Awesome, great. But Mary... She made the right choice, and it will not be taken away from her. Here's the third thing. You have the power to choose your margins. Mary made the right choice. I've heard people say before, Man, I was pushing myself so hard. I was just working all the time and not taking care of myself. And then I got real sick and God just had to sit me down and tell me to slow down, right? And sometimes I wonder, it's like, no, God told you to sit down way before you got yourself in that mess and your body told you to sit down. (laughs) Because your body said, I ain't made for this. Why would we wait for God to sovereignly sit us down when he's given us his wisdom to say, hey, let's avoid that? Amen? We can avoid that. He's given us the power to choose. Now, here's the thing is that this is the hardest part because you know how it goes. I want to lose 10 pounds, but I also want to eat ice cream. And you know what wins? Ice cream. Ice cream. Because it's 106 degrees outside. 
You know what I'm saying? It's hard to make the choice. And most of us live with distress or hyper stress because honestly, we think there's no other way. Like this is how we live. This is life in Houston, Texas. This is life in Richmond, Texas. It's so normal and it's so common. Last week, Jason walked us through the Sermon on the Mount and there's this one part where Jesus tells them, he says, do not worry saying what will we eat or what will we drink or what will, will we wear? So those are all like basic necessities. Don't worry about those things. Here's what he says, for the Gentiles eagerly seek all these things. Meaning everyone around you is running after that stuff. And he says this, your heavenly father knows that you need them. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness and all these things will be provided for you as well. What Jesus points to, and it's the reason why we have such a hard time making a choice, is that we trust in our own efforts outside the margin of our life. If we would just work a little harder, spend a little bit more time, maybe just push ourselves a little bit more, maybe pick up that extra 30 minutes in the morning or, or two hours in the evening or whatever it is, like whatever you're pushing yourself to do, right? If we will just push a little bit harder, everything is going to be okay. And we're trusting in our own efforts more than we trust in God to fill the gaps in our life. He knows that you need them. And he was actually going to provide them for you. Jesus reveals a core issue of trust for us. And so what would happen if we trusted the Lord more? because we know what happens when we max ourselves out. We, uh, we have this sort of little joke on Sundays when we say, what do you want, want to eat for lunch? And everyone says, Chick-fil-A. <laughs> and Chick-fil-A is closed on Sundays. It's my Chick-fil-A. Anybody know that? No, we don't need to go there. We don't need to go there closed on Sundays. And guess what? Monday through Friday or Monday through Saturday, there's like three lanes of cars circling the building. Have you ever thought about that before? There used to be these things called blue laws in America and you couldn't do anything on Sunday. Really? It's like, let's go to the store. Oh wait, it's closed. We can't. I guess we're just going to sit at home, right? And now that's all changed because of progress. And thank you for Chick-fil-A that's closed on Sundays. Because here's the thing. You might make less money if you did less. It's possible. But it's also possible that you might be a little bit better at your job because you took a little time to rest. You might, uh, you, you might get less done or you actually might get more done with the time you have because you took some time to rest. There's these blessings that are hidden in the way of the Lord. It really is the best way to live. If we will just trust him and lean into his provision, I believe your life's gonna actually get better by simply making the choice. Lastly, let me close with this quote. This is from Richard Swenson's book, Margin. He says, marginless is fatigue. Margin is energy. Marginless is red ink. Margin is black ink. Marginless is hurry. Margin is calm. Marginless is anxiety. Margin is security. Marginless is culture. Margin is counterculture. Marginless is the disease of the new millennium. Margin is its cure. When Jesus told Martha 
that what Mary had chosen was better and that it would not be taken from her, just think about what he's saying. What he's telling her is that if she would have welcomed them into the door, poured a few glasses of water, and sat down, that would have been better. Better. So I think for us, there, there's, there's a change of our mindset to really think about what is actually better. When margin decreases, your stress increases. As margin decreases, our relationships suffer, and you and I have the power to choose our margins. I need margin. How about you? Yeah. So how's your stress level this morning? I'll be honest, as I was reading books about stress, I felt stressed out. I was like, oh my gosh, I'm getting stressed reading about stress. Are you distracted? Are you worried? Are you upset? How are your relationships? God, self, others? Are you trusting your own effort more than you're trusting God? And what I want to ask us to do this morning, okay, I, I'm not saying go sell everything and lay it on the altar and let's, I, here's what I'm saying today, is I want you to just ask Jesus what is better than what I'm currently doing. I want you to ask him that. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Renaissance Church Sermon Podcast. To support our work, you can like, share, subscribe, or you can donate at rin-church.org.